just work. <laughs> All right, so today I'm here to talk to you about uh, maintaining your sanity while maintaining open source projects. Um, what I hope to bring to you is a set of tips and tools that I've learned over my career working with open source, uh, not only for maintainers of open source projects, for people who also consume open source projects, because uh, there's a lot of kind of anti-patterns you can do consuming open source that really prevent you from getting the best help from the maintainer. So we're going to talk about that. So, uh, as Sammy said, uh, I am Simon McDonald. I'm coming to you from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and immediately, what I've been struck at since I've been in this conference is that uh, the problems that we run into open source in North America are nearly identical to the ones that you're running into. So, as Charles said in his notes uh, earlier, that you have a bus uh, company here who doesn't want to open their data. We ran into exactly the same thing in Ottawa, so I would love to talk to you about that later. Perhaps there's some information we can share on that. Uh, but also, uh, this funny little slide here, it's what I like to call infinite Simons. So every time I do a presentation, I try to get somebody to take a picture of me uh, on this slide, and basically, that's me in Ottawa, and inside that picture, it's me in New Orleans, and inside that picture, it's me in uh, Montreal, and then it keeps on going all the way down. I've been doing it for about a year and a half now, so it's been, it's been kind of fun. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me after the, the conference is to uh, get me on Twitter at McDonest. Uh, sounds like a really funny uh, username, but it is my original Unix username from university, and it stands for McDonald Simon Thomas. Uh, so it's never in use anywhere. Um, now, I've been contributing to open source for over 20 years, which is really shocking to me because I, I went back and I, I thought about it not too long ago, but I actually landed a patch into the Linux kernel in order to get my CD-ROM to work. And I know that's making me sound really super old, and believe me, I feel every day of that. Uh, but yeah, CD-ROMs were these things that we had a long time ago that you can't even get into your laptops anymore. So, but over the past eight years or so, I've been working a lot in open source under the Apache project, uh, Apache Cordova, which is also known as Adobe PhoneGap, and it has spawned kind of a, a big ecosystem there. Um, and it seems weird that I'd be working at Adobe. It's not really known for its open source work, but oddly enough, uh, one of the reasons that I chose to go to Adobe is because it actually does do a lot with open source. And we just do a lot of it under the Apache Foundation, so there's not a lot of uh, kind of an Adobe open source org, but we're hoping to change that and let people know that what we're doing internally a bit more. So let's, uh, let's stop talking about me, and let's talk more uh, about open source. So, this is what I like to call the developer's curse. It's like, may you maintain a successful open source project. Now, when you're starting an open source project, of course, you want everybody to use your software. That's, that's kind of the, the purpose of this. You want people to get benefit from it. Uh, but it's kind of a double-edged sword <laughs> because as you write this code and you get people using it, and now they're going to be asking you questions, they're going to be asking you for support, they're going to be asking you so many things. And more and more, you'll get away from actually writing code and more into like managing the project. So my, my whole thing is, you know, be a little bit careful what you wish for. And in order to keep yourself from going nuts, there's some things that, that we can do to make this a lot easier. So first off, we'll talk about setting up your project. Um, now, if you already have an existing open source project, maybe some of these things you've done, maybe some of these things you've missed, and you might want to go back in and add them after the fact. And these are just some stuff that I've learned uh, that'll help you save your sanity and hopefully your hair if you still have some, unlike myself. All right, first off, include a readme. And in this readme, you should have an overview of what your project does. So it's great to have something that tells users what your project does, but it's also useful to say what your project is not going to do. Because a lot of times people will come in, want to take the project in a totally different direction. If you let them know upfront that, that that's not what we're going to do, that's not the problem that we're trying to solve, uh, then they can actually fork the project and go off and do it themselves because it's open source, that's the way it works. We also want some getting started instructions. Um, in my group, we have this thing, we call it uh, mean time to hello world, and we want it to be 10 minutes, no longer than 10 minutes from a person picking up your package to being able to execute the hello world uh, version of your package. So you want to give them instructions very clearly, like you know, clone this repository, run npm install, then npm run serve, You've up, you're up and running with our package. You want those instructions to be right up there in front in your readme. And 
It's never too early to start inviting people to contribute to your project. Believe me, uh, you want to tell people right away that you're very open to having uh, issues and pull requests raised on your project. You want to start getting these contributors as early as possible because you will want to turn them into maintainers someday. All right, so have a contributing document. So this is going to facilitate people uh, being able to uh, send pull requests and other information to your project. So what you want to do is you want to have just a brief overview of how to send a pull request. Now, most people know how to send a pull request, but it doesn't hurt to actually have that in your project. And uh, being able to link off to the GitHub documentation is particularly useful in this case. Um, you should have a style guide. And I know what you're thinking. A style guide? Really? Are we going to have the tabs versus spaces debate? And it's like, it, yeah, we are, because uh, when, you, when you have a style guide in your project, you're going to prevent people from going through and checking in code that completely changes all of the white space in your project. Now, it's really difficult to review a pull request when you're using spaces in your text editor and the person sending the pull request is using tabs, because in that case, every line that gets checked in looks like it's been changed. So that makes it very difficult to figure out what actually has been changed. So having things like a style guide where you're using something like um, editor config, or if you're using VS Code, there's a really good uh, opinionated style plugin called Prettier. If you have those things turned on for your project, that really limits the amount of just superfluous white, white, space, uh, white space changes that are going to be into those pull requests. So it's kind of a, a key thing to have. And also, space is forever. All right. Uh, this is kind of funny because uh, this used to be a bullet point, but I was talking to somebody at the speaker dinner last night and I decided to expand it to a slide. Uh, you really should establish a code of conduct up front. It really helps to create a uh, positive atmosphere in your project. And I know these days a lot of people are looking at open source projects and if they don't have a code of conduct, they don't even want to get involved. So this is one of the things that I had been remiss in having in a lot of my projects. So if you don't have a code of conduct, you should really look at adding one. Um, so it should include a number of things. And first is where it takes effects. Is this only in the issues? Is it in the comments of the code? Is it in events that you run? Just like where is the code of conduct applied? Who does it apply to? You want to let people know it applies to everyone, of course. Uh, what happens when somebody violates the code? So you want to like list what's going to happen when somebody uh, goes outside of the code of conduct because you want people to know that there are consequences to violating it. And how does one report violations? It's no good if you have a code of conduct but you don't actually tell people how to get a hold of you, how to report those violations. So. The earlier you establish one, the better off your project will be. Uh, so I've talked to other people who've run into issues where somebody has really been horrible uh, in an open source project and they didn't have a code of conduct. So when they actually try to uh, discipline that person, uh, that person feels attacked personally because there is no documentation whatsoever about what the code of conduct would be, what the kind of consequences it would be. So, in most cases, you want to have this code of conduct established up front. You don't want to apply it on a one-off basis. And that way, you won't be personally attacking somebody. You'll be able to refer them back to the thing like, nope, you violated the code of conduct that we've had for months or years. So important to have. So you want to add a license. You really want to add any license to your open source project. Well almost any license. Uh, so the reason that I'm saying you have to add a license is that if you do not put a license in your open source project, uh, what it happens is that it's assumed that all of that code is copywritten by you and nobody can use it. So that seems kind of weird considering like, you know, you're putting it up on a public Git repository and you want people to use it. But without a license, that's really what it means. So for bigger companies or for people that are coming in to use the project, if they don't see a license, they're just going to kind of steer away from that project altogether. And uh, when I say almost any license, uh, particularly what I like to use is the Apache license. It's uh, very open. Uh, it allows for forking of the project, for contributing uh, to the project quite easily. Um, however, if I'm doing a blog post or if I'm doing sample code, then I'm going to use the MIT license. So the MIT license is even more uh, kind of permissive. It allows you to do absolutely anything with the code because it's applied as is. Uh, so that way, if somebody reads one of your blog posts or grabs some of your sample code and it ends up into their product, 
they don't have to worry about open sourcing that code. You say, like, it's okay, you can do whatever you want with it, as opposed to this kind of the Apache license. And I tend to try to avoid uh, the GPL and the LGPL license whenever possible because those copyleft license can potentially infect your entire code base. Uh, unless you have like a really good reason to use one of those, I would kind of steer away from that for now. All right. Uh, you also want to decide when you're setting up your project how you're going to handle issues versus questions. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways that I look at this. Uh, first is you put everything into GitHub. Personally, that's the way that I like to have it. I like to check one spot for any kind of issues about the, the project. So this way, if there's an actual bug on the project or a feature request, that goes into issues. But if somebody has a question for me on how something works, I also handle that in GitHub issues. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier for me to check one inbox for this type of thing. Um, a lot of other people like to put only, only issues, uh, only bug requests, only feature requests. Uh, into GitHub and then handle everything else on Stack Overflow. So Stack Overflow is a, is a pretty good uh, way of doing this, uh, but again, I don't want to have to like, go searching through Stack Overflow, even though there are some really good Chrome extensions that allow you to do that a lot easier. But that's completely up to you how you want to handle it. Just have to think about it before you get you know, 400, 500, 600 issues. Now, on the topic of the number of issues, don't worry about it if you're getting tons and tons of issues in your open source project. That's actually a good thing. That means people are using your project. It's okay. It, don't worry about it. All right. So speaking of issues, uh, this is actually from somebody who works for the Eclipse Foundation. Um, yeah, don't ever, don't ever do that. If I know a lot of times we're under time pressures and we're really upset because we're trying to use some new package and it just doesn't work for you, but going into their, their issues and saying like, yeah, your project just doesn't work, that's not helpful. That's not gonna get you any support. Uh, that's not gonna make the maintainer of the project feel any better uh, because they're gonna have to like, ask you a million questions like, what do you mean by it doesn't work? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? So just don't do this on any open source project ever because you wouldn't want somebody to do this to you. So how can you get around that? Create an issue template. This is also another thing that you want to do. If you go in and you're creating a new issue and you see that the maintainer has listed a bunch of things in the issue template that you need to fill in, uh, don't go and delete all of that and just freeform your own stuff in. There's a reason the, the maintainer did this. Uh, they probably have some very good questions about you know, what version of the software you're using, how you tried to test it. There's some things that they've learned over time that they put into that issue template in order to make your, their life easier and to get you a response quicker. So please do not delete the issue template. So what do we look for in a good issue template? Well, it might seem dumb, but right off the bat, ask the user if he searched the past issues. You'll be surprised how often they haven't done that. Um, it's, it's so much fun to like, get that same question a million times, but if people would just uh, search for the issues, that would be great. Um, so really it's your last opportunity before they fill out the rest of the issue template to remind the user not to be lazy and kind of search for the answer first. All right, you wanna ask them what the expected behavior is because in a lot of cases, their expected behavior may not be how your software works at all. So you really wanna you know, get them to tell you what they're expecting to see in, in the project. And then what the actual behavior is. It's like, okay, after I've done my test, this is what I'm seeing. So we wanna kind of get that kind of delta between the expected and the actual behavior. And then you want a reproduction scenario. Uh, a couple of things that I always wanna see in a reproduction scenario is the version of the package that you're using. Uh, it's amazing how many times somebody will come in and ask a question and I'll be like, wow, that, that doesn't seem right at all. And then it's like, oh yeah, they're using a version of the software that's a year and a half old. And it's like, I've already forgotten about the problems that were in that. So knowing the version is like super useful for uh, debugging some of these things. And then some sample code. Uh, you want a minimal uh, a bit of sample code that can be used to reproduce the problem. And if you can collect logs or screenshots, you know, do that. That's gonna be really beneficial for the maintainer in order to get you an answer as quick as possible. All right. So when it comes to triaging issues, as, an, as a maintainer of an open source project, you're gonna have to go in on your schedule, you decide if you do it daily, weekly, every two weeks, however you decide, but you're gonna need to like triage all of those issues because 
you know, 100, 200, 400 may accumulate over time and you really need to go through them because you don't want the weight of all of those issues just kind of crushing you and keeping you from like working on the project. You also don't want to go, I don't know, I feel really guilty when I see issues that haven't been addressed on my project and I don't know if you feel like that as well, but you, you don't want to have to go mad from that guilt. So, <coughs> one thing that I like to do is if I go in and I see that the, the submitter hasn't followed the issue template, well, then I immediately close it. So it's done, it's out of my queue at that point in time. Um, you don't really have time to go back and forth with the user in order to figure out what they have done and haven't done. That's why you have an issue template. You wanna have that information up front. So you wanna, if you want to be respected in the open source community, please follow what the maintainer is asking for. So also, uh, you know, I talk about GitHub a lot here and basically we do a lot of our stuff on GitHub. Uh, it seems to be where a lot of open source is happening right now. I know there's other ones like GitLab and Bitbucket and they have similar uh, functionality as well. But basically, for this type of thing, I have a can reply in GitHub that just basically says, hey, you didn't fill out the issue template. Please reopen the issue when you fill in that information. And usually that takes care of things. So another type of issue is one that the submitter is asking a question that's been answered before. Well, I close that because the question's been asked before. If the user had actually searched the issues, you know, they would have been able to find the answer for themselves. I also tend to tag that as a duplicate issue and then link to the original uh, answered uh, question as well. So that makes life a little easier. Now, you've requested an update on an issue and it's been two months or whatever kind of, uh, you know, deadline that you give it before the issue becomes stale. Um, at that point in time, I close the issue. It's like, all right, obviously the user has moved on and they're either no longer using your package or they've found a way around their problem and they just haven't bothered to come back in and update the issue. You don't want those hanging around. And uh, so what I do is I, I just close it. Now, closing the issue is gonna send an email off to the um, originator of the issue and maybe that pings them and they go, oh, wait, I didn't get that fixed or I did get that fixed and they can come back and they can update the issue for you. Now, there's, um, there's an interesting uh, extension uh, on GitHub, it's called uh, ProBot. I forget the company that actually does it, uh, but they have a bot that you can enable for your repositories, which allows you to scan for stale issues, and then they will automatically uh, mark them as stale and then close them after a specific amount of time that you set. So that makes dealing with stale issues uh, really, really quite easy. All right, so the submitter comes in, they ask a really dumb, obvious question. Come on, what do we do with that? Come on, what? Say it, say it now. No, we don't close it, that's a horrible thing. <laughs> you document that. So here's the thing, if somebody comes in and they ask what you think is a really dumb, obvious question, that's because you know the software better than anyone else, okay? So that's a signal that your documentation is not as great as it should be, and you should take that as an opportunity to mark it as a doc issue and go ahead and fix that at your earliest opportunity. Sorry, I had to trick you there, I couldn't help it. All right, so the submitter is asking for new functionality. Well, that's obviously an enhancement. You can tag that as an enhancement. You can uh, put that in your backlog. Perhaps you can schedule it for an upcoming release of your software. That's great, that's something that you can handle. You can have nice discussions about how this enhancement should be done. So we're getting, we're getting closer to actually doing code. This is a great thing. So finally, we've got, we've got a new issue and the template is filled out and it's a reproducible issue. This is, this is great, this is a great feeling. So you can actually mark this as a bug. This is this moment that you're like, oh, thank you, I get to write code again. It's like, I'm not actually just doing management all the time. Okay, so your first thought may be like, I'm gonna go in and fix this right away because finally I get to write some code in my day job. Maybe don't. If the issue is pretty easy or if you wanna give uh, people the opportunity to contribute to your project, you can mark it as a bug. You can put a tag on it like, you know, good for a first commit or, you know, new committers only. Uh, basically signal to people that you would like some help on this. And then if, you know, some period of time passes and nobody's really picked up the, the torch and fixed this bug, 
then go ahead and do it yourself. But give people the opportunity to contribute. Don't always immediately go and kind of pick off those, those easy to fix bugs right away because you want to give people the opportunity to, uh, to add to your project. All right, so people are way more difficult than code. Dealing with code is the easiest thing in the open source world. Dealing with people, not so much. Uh, now Jed Watson here, it's what he says is at some point in time, someone is going to come into your project and they're just gonna bring hate. And that's why you have a code of conduct to be able to deal with some of that stuff. But I just wanna let you know that it's gonna happen. <laughs> And that's kind of a rite of passage. It just means that your project is useful enough, it's popular enough that people have decided to hate on it. Don't feel bad about it. You can't make everybody happy. That's definitely something I've learned over my way too many years on this planet. So uh, also, just the truism of the internet is that, uh, you know, don't feed the trolls. Wow, this is fancy. I don't even know how to open that. All right. <laughs> so. What you want to be able to do is to set boundaries. Now, here's another tweet from Nolan Lawson, and it's something that I struggle with as well, I think I mentioned it a bit earlier, is that you know I don't have as much time as I want to to be able to go in and fix all of the issues to you know answer all the questions that people have from an open source project. Uh, last night, uh, after we got back from the speaker dinner, I spent way too many hours actually answering questions because you know time zone changes and fun stuff like that. I wasn't quite ready to go to sleep, and I wish I would have a little earlier, but that's life. So my thing is, you need to make yourself happy first. You're not gonna have kind of the energy, the enthusiasm to work on the project if you're not in a good headspace, if you're not happy. So don't feel like you have to say yes to every bug report or feature request that comes into the project because you're giving your code you know, away freely. Uh, you're giving your time away freely in most cases, but you're not giving your life away. So you have to kind of set some boundaries there. Now, you want to be respectful of the person at the other end of the issue. That's 100% that's true. So you don't want to completely flame or come down really hard on the person on the other end of the issue because they're a real human being as well. Uh, but you gotta understand that if you come in and you really slam somebody in the issues, it's, it's not gonna make them feel very good. It's not gonna be a very good signal to the next person that comes into your project and starts reading some of these things. So you wanna be respectful at all times. Uh, you also wanna be empathic. Um, you have to realize that the person that's trying to use your project may have just wasted two valuable days of their own time trying to get this working. And they may not be as smart as you, they may not be as talented as you, or your documentation may not be as good. Mm. But you know, you want to be empathic to them that they have wasted uh, some. They pro potentially have wasted some time. But at the same time, be firm because you're in control of the time that you spend on the open source project, uh, and feel free to shut down unproductive discussions. Uh, sometimes you'll get into this back and forth with somebody, and it's going absolutely nowhere. And it's like, okay, this isn't going anywhere. How do I get out of this tactfully? Uh, the best way that I found to do it is to say all right, why don't you send me a pull request? It's amazing how much that works. Because uh, a lot of times people will want you to just like, go off and implement their crazy idea, but then when you ask them for the pull request, they're like, well, I don't know how to do that. Or I don't have time to do that. And it's like, well, I'm sorry, it's, you know, it's not something I have time for either. So that's a really good way of, of shutting down uh, unproductive discussions. So yeah. So. On the topic of pull requests, what about them? So you should be asking for pull requests absolutely all the time. Uh, you wanna get to a point where you're not the only maintainer of your project. You wanna get as many contributors and maintainers as, as possible. So you should have a pull request template in order to do this. We've talked about this a bit earlier. So it should have a description of what the, uh, the change that's being offered to your project uh, should let tagged to a related issue. Some people have a very hard and fast rule on this where they won't accept a pull request unless it's tagged to an issue that's already been discussed in the repository. You know, that's up to you to decide whether you wanna do that. It's not a half bad idea though. Uh, and then you wanna have the type of change. Is it a bug fix? Is it a new feature? Is it a breaking change? Uh, you wanna kind of get this kind of information up front because that's gonna change how your Semver works. So if it's a breaking change, you're gonna have to bump the major. You're gonna have to let users know to potentially that there is something breaking in this. And as well, 
you want to have this checklist to make sure that the maintainer is following you know, the stuff that is in your project. You know, are they following the style guide? Have, are they using the editor config? Or are they using Prettier in order to keep the code correct? Uh, is there any documentation changes that are required with this uh, pull request? Have they read the contributing document? Have they made sure that they know how to contribute to this project? Or have they added tests? Are those tests passing? Uh, those are things that you want to like at least mention in the pull request. I'm not saying that people have to check every one of those things in order to have the pull request uh, accepted by you, but you should at least ask them if those things are necessary. So you don't have to merge in every pull request. Um, it's really not necessary. Sometimes people are trying to uh, add things to your project that's not really central to what the project does. So you're well within your rights to say, thank you, I really appreciate your time, but we're not going to go this way. Uh, also, don't be afraid to push back a little bit on pull requests. If it's not exactly up to the standard that you have set for the project, you know, ask the person for some changes. You can do that through pull requests quite easily. So go ahead and do that. Uh, and in fact, this is a really good chance to be able to ask the originator of the pull request and maybe add some tests to the project because that really helps with things. So <laughs> when it comes to building community, uh, this is commit strip. It's a very funny uh, tech-based uh, cartoon on the online. And a lot of people think this is how open source projects are maintained, that there is this you know, giant group of people that are all working together trying to get stuff out. And that's true. There are a lot of open source projects that are like that. Uh, but more often than not, this is what it's like. And this was me last night. I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm just going to get one more question answered before I go to bed. Um, so what you want to do is you want to build that community so you're not at home alone in the middle of the night trying to answer some questions. And in order to do that, you want to make it as easy for people to contribute to the project. Ways that you can do that are by identifying beginner bugs. We talked about that a bit earlier. So that lets people know coming into the project that this isn't, a really, isn't really a high bar to be able to jump over. So this is something that can get working uh, on right away. You want to document the heck out of things. You want more documentation than you think you need. If you think you have enough, add more. So you want people to be able to use your project as easily as possible. You want them uh, getting up and running as quickly as possible as well. Um, also, if you see an issue and you're like, ah, you know, I, I covered that in the documentation. Why, why is the person asking this question? You know, go to them in that issue and say, oh, hey, it's covered over here in the documentation. Was there something about it that wasn't clear? Use that as an opportunity to enhance your documentation, not just say, oh, hey, it's over here, you know, go away and read it. Get, get a chance to get some feedback from people. And then, of course, when it comes to open source, it's not always about code. There are many other ways to uh, add value to an open source project. Uh, there could be, you know, things like um, doing a project website, you know, adding documentation, uh, doing translations of documentation. That is a huge benefit if people can come in from uh, other countries who speak a language different than yours and can do translations. Uh, I'm lucky enough to work on a project where I have uh, one friend, he's from uh, Brazil, so he speaks Portuguese, and I have another friend who's in Spain, so he speaks Spanish, so that really makes my life a lot easier when people come in and they ask questions that I just can't handle because, unfortunately, Google Translate is not that great. I'm sure you've tried to use it. It's not super wonderful when it comes to technical things like that. So give people different ways to be able to contribute to the project. And then you want to turn contributors to your project into maintainers. If you get somebody who's coming into your project like a second time, ask them if they want to be a maintainer. And you're like, wow, that's a really low bar for things. And it's like, yeah, it is. But ask them if they want to help maintain the project. Um, it's going to be a huge win for you because you'll have somebody to help you when you have to take vacation or something crazy in your life comes up like, oh, triplets. Oh my god, how did that happen? Um, so there's, it's a huge win for getting those people in. And believe me, being asked to be a maintainer of an open source project is an honor, and most people will feel very honored and accept that right away. Now, you may be thinking like, no, this project, it's my baby. I don't want to give up the tight control of this project. It's like, you're still the owner of the project, so you can go in and, and change things after the fact. It's only source code. You can always revert a commit if you don't like it. So don't worry about having to have such tight control. And thank people for their efforts. This is something that we forget quite frequently, that 
gives you a huge benefit and it costs you absolutely nothing. When somebody sends in a pull request, you know, and you've merged it, you know, thank them for their time. Even if you don't merge the pull request, still thank them for your time. If you're doing releases, maybe a tweet like this that says like, you know, these people really helped out by adding some functionality, or even uh, what I've recently done is there's a node package that will go through all of the commits in your open source project and add those uh, GitHub user IDs and images to your uh, readme document. So that way people can go to the project and say like, yeah, I helped out on that. Um, so one of the crazy things for me is there is a uh, source code editor called nEdit. Uh, it was on the Unix uh, system. And I added some syntax highlighting code for Java way back in, I think, 1997 or something like that when I was in university. And my name is still in there. I can still pull up nEdit and say, like, hey, I'm one of the people that contributed to it. And for some reason, that still fills me, fills me with joy. So bring that joy to other people as well. So tests. Well, you got to have tests, but you don't need a lot of tests, uh, mostly regression. So you may want to split your test suite into two separate things. Uh, you can have a regression test suite so that anybody doing a pull request has to run these tests, and that just basically makes sure that their change doesn't like break anything major. And then you can have a, a larger test suite that you run after the fact in order to make sure like everything's covered. But you don't want the test suite to be so large and takes such a long time to run that people are not interested in sending a pull request to your project. Now documentation, as I said, you want to document the heck out of stuff. So my whole thing is you want to start with the bare minimum of the readme. We talked about some of the important things to have in a readme. You want to start with that. Uh, you want to continually enhance that readme. You can split off into other markdown pages uh, that can be linked from the readme to build up your whole documentation suite. And if you get really fancy and you have somebody that's uh, good at building sites, you can use things like GitHub Pages in order to host your project site and have a lot more documentation there as well. Uh, when it comes to releasing, you know, it's something that I struggled with for a long time because I would always want to get that one more feature into the release of my project and thereby I would be delaying, 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 delaying the release. And that's not what you really want. You want to have kind of a more consistent cadence when it comes to an open source project. So two ways that I can think of to mitigate this is one is that you release on every commit. So just have an automated process that every time there's a commit, you tag a release and it goes out there. So anybody wants to pick up the latest and greatest can do that. Or what I try to do as much as possible is release on a time-based schedule Maybe at the end of the month, you pull in all of the uh, changes that you've made to the project and you do a release at that point in time. And you can, of course, decide on the time frame yourself. Uh, but that really helps me because I'm like, okay, I said I was gonna release something this month, so I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna wait until that next bug fix is in. I can get that in next month's release. So by having that cadence, you know that users are not gonna have to wait that long for a bug fix all the time. And, uh, you want to automate your release process as much as possible. Um, when you have issues with uh, having to do everything manually, you, people can make mistakes. It's harder for a person coming into the project in order to do a release. You want to make it easy for people to do that. So automate as much as possible. Now, this is a comic from XKCD. Uh, Randall Monroe is the, um, the guy who writes and draws this. Um, I wish that this was just a joke, but it's reality. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have been guilty of this. Uh, one of the things that I was doing, uh, we were releasing a lot of plugins, and uh, each of the plugins had these repeatable steps. So I created a new open source project that made the repeatable steps of releasing a plugin easier. So now I'm maintaining the, the automation tool more than, I'm uh, more than I'm maintaining the plugins. So yep, sometimes art imitates life, and sometimes life imitates art. All right. so. I'm over time, I should get off stage. So I want you to remember one thing, always be closing. So don't allow the, the issued debt to uh, just kind of fill up and uh, kind of weigh on you mentally. Just if there's issues that aren't following the issue template or questions that have always been answered, you know, please go ahead and close them. Uh, and also if you're, if you're not familiar with this particular screenshot, this is from Glengarry Graham Ross, uh, Alec Baldwin was in it for a very short but memorable amount of time. I really recommend that as a movie. So 
Uh, we'll get the slides out to everyone, and if you're interested, there's a number of resources here at the end and some further reading as well. So I'll be around uh, for the next uh, two days in the conference. If there's anything that you want to chat with me about, you know, please approach me. I'm Canadian, so I'm very polite. I, I will be here for you. All right. Thanks. Maybe we don't have time for one question. <laughs> I, I'm Canadian. I'm very polite. You can ask me anything. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so I'm going to repeat that for anybody who didn't hear it. So as you're constantly closing issues, um, do people take that as kind of a, a rude gesture? And uh, how do I take that as a Canadian is kind of the follow-up question. Uh, so as a Canadian, I'm very, very sorry about it. Uh, so. But as a, as a maintainer who has limited amounts of time, I'm not sorry at all. Um, so when I'm closing issues all the time, I, have, I actually, if you go to my my Twitter page, the, my pinned tweet right now is after I close an issue because the person did not provide any information whatsoever, they responded with, you're really great, you should work at the DMV. And for those of you who don't know, that's the Department of Motor Vehicles in the United States, which is one of the least friendly places you've ever gone in your life. So yeah, sometimes you do get that pushback, um, but I try to be as you know, non-specific as possible. I have canned responses when I'm closing things. So it's not like I'm uh, generically, I'm, I'm generically responding to each one of these people. I'm not personally attacking them. It's just like, you haven't followed the issue template, I'm closing it. And it's like, you haven't responded in two months, I'm closing it. Uh, also, I think I mentioned it earlier in the talk, uh, ProBot, which is a, uh, something that you can add to your projects. It will do scans, it will find stale issues, uh, it will lock old issues. Uh, one of the things I struggle with is people will come in, an issue that's been closed for over a year because the bug has been fixed, but they'll have similar symptoms and they'll start commenting on it. Well, that issue is, is dead to me, so I don't want to see that anymore. So using something like ProBot, where it's not even you that's closing the issue, is, is a huge win as well. And it kind of, again, takes away that whole rudeness thing because a robot can't be rude. All right. Thank you again.